Welcome, everything is fine. You are listening to Fork and Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian. I'm Jason. And we'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. Today we're talking about Season 3, Episode 8, The Worst Possible Use of Free Will. It was written by Cord Jefferson, directed by Claire Scanlon, and it aired November 8th, 2018. Do you want to get right into the episode? Please. Okay. Eleanor demands to see her memories of falling in love with Chidi. Michael shows her using a device Janet created. Michael gives Eleanor a quick inoculation and then shows her the moment Chidi fell for her. All right, so first thing I notice in this episode is the giant sign outside of the library that says, Tostitos Presents, a public library brought to you by GoDaddy. <laughs> and I thought that was so funny because it makes complete sense why they would shoot pornos there now. Because GoDaddy, come on, GoDaddy is like mostly porno sites. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's a host. Yeah, but like they mostly host porn sites. I think. Anyway, that's kind of like the stereotype. Okay. So that made me laugh quite a bit. And then we get Jeff Foxworthy's poetry book, Roses Are Red and So Is My Neck. And Shall I compare thee <laughs> to a summer's Daytona 500? <laughs> it's so good. Uh, how did you feel about the reveal of Eleanor's reaction, I guess? Like seeing her with the bald cap and the like tiny bits of hair, her eyes like I mean freaking out and <laughs> it was disgusting. Yeah, it was kind of terrifying. If anybody's watched Hannibal, the T V show or the movie, uh she looks just like Mason Verger. Oh. And if you don't know who that is, you just Google it and it'll be basically the exact same look that Eleanor was sprouting. Yeah, but like with slightly looser skin because he's old, right? And ate his own face. Right, yeah. Yeah. Ugh. I just wanted to quickly point out a few more things in the background before we get into the actual story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, behind Michael, there's a book on the on the bookshelf that just stood out to me mm. and it it was called the barefaced messiah which is a biography of the leader of the church of scientology uh l ron hubbard mm. the book takes a very critical perspective of the church and of hubbard himself i don't know i mean i feel like it's pretty easy to critique scientology right <laughs> oh yeah it, they used um the church of scientology is very secretive mm. about all their practices and their paperwork and their you know, documents. Oh. And the book was written w through uh, items that were brought back from a defector. Okay. Somebody who left the church and had all these details. So it's kind of interesting seeing that book in the background. I I'm sure it's very possible it was just coincidence, but it stood out to me. Right. No, I like that. And there's also... It was a smart choice. Yes. For sure. There was also, of course, that motivational poster in the background, the gratitude. <laughs> I couldn't see what was underneath I know, it. I didn't see the subtext either, but uh. I know it was a whale. Also, uh. a little bit later on in the episode, there is another book on the shelf which stood out to me for some reason. I'm not sure why it did, but it was called Snow in August, which is, according to the little blurb, um, which is the story of an unlikely friendship and how the neighborhood reacts to it. What? Oh, my God. I know. So when Michael decides to show Eleanor a little bit more of Reboot 119, Chidi says to her that they're done with Nietzsche and they're moving on to free will versus determinism. So I like that. It was really obvious, but I didn't catch it on the first watch because I was just so happy to see Chidi and Eleanor together in the good place again. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was very sweet. I'm really glad that we got to actually see the moment where Chidi falls in love with Eleanor. Mm -hmm. In 2.10, um, Best Self, Michael says, You handed him a tissue right before he sneezed, and that simple act of anticipating his needs made him fall for you. And I think it's really sweet. We do, like, we do see it. It's very, very mundane. You know, someone passing you a tissue isn't a grand gesture, but... That's what I like about it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't some big romantic thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like that moment like, mm -hmm. holy crap, I think I'm falling in love with her. Yeah, as Rebecca Bunch would say. From? Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Oh my god, I think I like you, you know? Uh <laughs> so back when 
Michael explains the episode in season two, uh, Best Self. Mm -hmm. Uh, He sets up this whole episode basically way back then. And of course, the writers probably were just picking one that they thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. And Michael just says, all the restaurants were kebab places and you had a pet lizard, which I made poop on you all the time. Yeah. And just the offhand little remark. And now we get to see it. Yeah. Awesome lizard. Yeah. It paid off. That lizard is amazing. Well, it's an iguana, right? Iguanas are lizards. Yeah, but I mean, let's be specific. Okay. So that iguana is amazing. Mm-hmm. And I kind of want an iguana now. <laughs> I don't know. We had one in our grade six class. Our <gasps> teacher had a, a giant cage at the back, which Spike the iguana would live in. Mm. And sometimes when we'd come to school in the morning, there'd be a sign on the door saying, Spike is out. <gasps> and then we'd go in knowing that the... The lizard, the iguana, would be roaming around the floors and doing his iguana things. Oh my god! It was a lot of fun. That is so cool! And it was like the perfect pet to have for a classroom because they didn't smell, they didn't make any noise, they don't they don't really move very fast <laughs> unless they really want to. <laughs> and well, they don't really yeah. climb very well on... Like, Not people's on, heads, right? Yeah, on yeah. desks. Okay. So it was really cool. And we had these big um, oven mitts to handle him with and mm. feed him. And yeah, it was, it was very neat. Oh, I'm Definitely so a unique pet to have for a classroom. Yeah. Your teacher definitely watched a little too much Magic School Bus. <laughs> <laughs> he was actually one of my favorite teachers in the whole world. Oh. Absolutely great. Hmm. Uh, anyway. We had and- hamsters. they did smell but they were really fluffy so that's okay that's fair (laughs) Uh, the last thing that michael says was and you had your first kiss which gross kissing is gross you just (laughs) mash your food holes together it's not for that (laughs) oh i miss that michael sometimes i mean i love caring sweet more human michael Mm mm-hmm but sometimes you just want to hear about how gross it is to mash your mouths together. <laughs> and if anyone's watched Future Man, uh, the oh characters also don't believe in kissing with the mouth because that's gross because it's just rat hole to rat hole. Because they eat rats. Yeah. You forgot to explain that part. <laughs> because they eat rats. So, yeah. You know, rat hole. Gross. In Reboot 119, Michael organized a pick a pet day where the four humans chose animal companions. Eleanor chose a lizard, Tahani chose Mirror Centaur, Jason chooses a penguin, and Chidi couldn't decide between two puppies, so he ended up with an owl. Michael tries to dissuade Eleanor from watching the whole reboot, but she insists. Hmm. Okay, pick a pet day. The way Michael says, we have hundreds of beautiful animals for you to choose from, but what he doesn't say is, but there's only one of each, so if you don't get what you like, you're screwed. Um, what if you want many of them? What if you want several cats? You get one. Your soul bonds to the one. That's how That's it works. That's very monogamous pet ownership stuff. It's almost Very like... monogamous soul bonding with an animal. Uh-huh. I'm just saying. You can uh-huh. bond with more than one. <laughs> just saying. Polyamorous pet love. It's a soul love. bond and it's a form of torture. I actually do love, I know I'm complaining a little bit about the mythical creatures, but I do love the mirror centaur. And I also love Tahani's immediate reaction to be, to it, kind of being a little bit about lust. Oh, yeah. It's very lustful, right? I feel definitely like Tahani's hot for Tahania. Yeah, of course. It reminds me of Eleanor when she says in season one that uh, hooking up with someone with the same name is kind of a fun narcissistic fantasy. Mm -hmm. But... To me, the mirror centaur is a terrifying concept. Okay. To see yourself as others see you, I don't know if anybody actually wants that. Oh, yeah. I feel like there's way too much cringe involved. It could be just awful. Um, It reminds me of a Calvin and Hobbes comic strip where Calvin creates duplicates of himself just so he can have his duplicates do his chores and go to school for him. He thinks they'll all be pushovers when they actually turn out to be just like him. Kind of jerks. And he's (laughs) shocked. (laughs) I can't believe it. Tahani mentions that she had one of Barbara Streisand cloned dogs, which killed herself. And so, of course, I had to look that up to see whether she actually did do that. And yeah, absolutely did. What? She cloned cats? She did. Um, 
in what an the interview hell, Barbara? with Barbara. <laughs> In an interview with Variety magazine, Miss Streisand revealed that two of her three Catan de Tullier dogs were cloned from cells taken from the mouth and stomach of her previous dog who died named Samantha. So yeah, Miss Streisand has two cloned dogs. Okay. She really loved her, her dog. She wanted more of them. All right. She says they have different mannerisms, but she's waiting until they grow up to see the familiarities hmm. okay <laughs> that's so weird all right moving on from that uh, <laughs> <laughs> i wonder how the penguin's supposed to be torture for jason because penguins just seem awesome and he also wears a jaguar's jersey jersey later but why would a monk want to dress their penguin in a jersey okay fine whatever but he didn't have to do that. So I'm just saying, like, a penguin isn't torture. I can't tell me what what would make a penguin torture. That's a flaw. Michael, think about these things. <laughs> the transition between from the good place back to the library, mm-hmm. for me, it was really jarring. It was. And I'm sure it was just for Eleanor as well. Like, she was there. She was back there. She was, mm-hmm. you know... I almost forgot we still weren't in the good place (laughs) and really made me miss the old neighborhood and how much I would love to watch full length episodes about different reboots. Yes, (laughs) I would do it 100%. Yeah. Especially that one reboot where Tahani was Eleanor's soulmate. Like, Mm -hmm. I want to see that. I want to see how that worked out at all. I think that's interesting. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure it was great for like 10 or 20 minutes and then they just hated each other yeah exactly it would have been amazing to watch (laughs) so then when we're thrown back in again we get to see eleanor with her iguana climbing her head which was so funny (laughs) that i didn't hear a thing tahani said the first time i watched it because i was so focused on the iguana that was it is this is it going to climb? It's cli- it's climbing on her. Is she going to... Are they going to cut? Is it... No. They're, no. Are they going to still... No. It's climbing on... It's on her head. <laughs> that was my whole thought process. Uh, Kristen Bell did such a remarkable job, like, keeping a straight face during this scene. And Tahani as well. Mm. Like, oh my God. Like, watching it just climb over her face... <laughs> And then with its claws in her head, like, oh, so funny. So good. Uh, And we get um, Tahanya being like Al Jamil judgment concentrate. Like, Mm. she's just that. It's it's great. I love it. I really get how that's torture for her. So, So I like that one. I feel like that one was well thought out. There's a teleporting panda bear for like a second of screen time when they go back to the neighborhood. Is that what that thing is? The little zip. The little I paused streak so of many light. times and I couldn't see it. Yeah, there's a little panda up above, like on the second floor of some building, and then it just zips over to another area. Catch the magic panda. Yeah. In season two, that was one of Jason's ideas. Oh, really? Was it? Yeah. Catch oh. the flying panda, steal his magic, something like that. There you go. Oh, my God. It was very, very quick. It only happened after... It was like one second. Holy moly. Okay. Oh, also, when Tahani says, turns out centaurs are a bit tricky, <laughs> she's saying that while the iguana is climbing over Eleanor's face. So I'm like, ah, let's see. A centaur that, like, talks down to you or a <laughs> lizard that climbs all over your face. I mean, both are tricky. Both are tricky. Do you have any idea what the significance of the animals is? Like, an owl, to me, seems like knowledge. Like, I think of an owl as, like, a wise mm-hmm. For sure. creature, I suppose. And I know centaurs are supposed to be extremely proud and very beautiful. Okay. So that fits. Yeah. Um. I don't know. Are iguanas just difficult? Iguanas? Well, <laughs> iguanas may be a little cold. Because um, they're cold-blooded. Yeah, but also, like, they're not as expressive as perhaps, like, a dog, right? I'm Mm -hmm. not putting down iguanas at all. I think they're really cool. If you've got one, I'm sure they're full of personality. 
but like at first glance don't mm-hmm. appear as emotionally connected to humans. And a penguin is wears a tuxedo kind of look to it. And uh, Jason once wore a tuxedo that he ripped the arms off of. So sure. Yeah. I don't know. Penguins are cool, man. So maybe that's just all it is. Jason's a cool dude. Eleanor kisses Chidi after he comes to her aid. They fall in love, spending all their time together. They begin to suspect Michael, so they flee to the medium place where they finally profess their love. When they return, they confront Michael and he reboots them once again. So I actually really love this kiss. It's nice that it's understated, kind of like Chidi's realization. I love that in this moment, Eleanor's taking care of him. Because of something that she did. But she's taking care of him. And she wants to kiss him only when she realizes that he gave up this amazing opportunity to help her. And she realizes like, oh, he's sacrificing things for me. Like he genuinely wants to be around me and help me. Mm -hmm. And I also like that she makes the first move. Because that means Chidi doesn't have to overanalyze his uh, reactions. And it's also a parallel to the kiss at the end of the last season when Chidi rushes over to Eleanor. They like to surprise each other with these first kisses, apparently. (laughs) Plus, I mean, Chidi's wrapped up in a towel and he looks all snuggly. I mean, who wouldn't want to kiss him? (laughs) Jason, tell me you wouldn't want to kiss Chidi. I wouldn't want to kiss Chidi. That's a lie. (laughs) Come on, it's 2018, Jason. (laughs) It felt like a very subtle callback to season one, episode two, uh, flying. Mm -hmm. When Eleanor, she gives up her chance to fly so she can, quote unquote, help Chidi. But she really is helping the neighborhood because she kind of feels forced to. But Mm -hmm. she's still giving up her chance to fly. Just like Chidi is. I get It's way more selfishly motivated. Oh, absolutely. For sure. But this time it's the other way around, of course. Yeah, it's no. uh, it's same, but different. Mm-hmm. And what she says to Michael, no matter what he does, we'll find each other. We'll help each other. Yeah. I like it. It's super corny, but yeah, it's really sappy, but I really like it. And, you know, I want to believe that their love and their connection is stronger than memory. Of course. That's the dream, right? It's this romantic notion that in every possible iteration of life you two are so destined that you'll always find each other and you'll always be together in some way it's beautiful yeah it's like penny and and desmond when they're on the phone together in that episode that's like the best episode in the entire universe but the show right after that says soulmates aren't real and so yeah they kick you in the gut (laughs) beautiful story is just that it's a story yeah right and oh my god soulmates aren't real yeah, that's so it's a canon. Bit of a wrench in the gears. Yeah, I mean, we said back in season one we didn't believe this was legit. Right. We also just don't believe in soulmates in general, but mm-hmm. we pretty much called it. I think back in season one, saying like, "Yeah, I think that this is just a a good way for Michael to torture the humans." Mm-hmm. Yeah, because logistically, it's kind of difficult to imagine soulmates, like. Your soulmate has to die around the same time or else you're going to spend eternity without them or not eternity, but, you know, could be decades, could be, you know, does everybody's soulmate born the same time that they're born? Like, are they in the same country? Like, just thinking about the logistics (laughs) is just mind boggling. Yeah, it's like, that's a lot of work you got to do. Why don't you just let the humans with their tiny brains figure it out for themselves? Give them free will. They can choose who they want to love. Ah. Oh, I love that too. That's perfect. I didn't even think about how soulmates fit into this whole idea of, de- wow, determinism. Yeah. Hm. I want to say I thought of that, but I didn't. <gasps> Just a tiny, tiny note about this scene with um, Chidi and Eleanor confronting Michael. The way that Chidi and Eleanor are holding hands and sitting there really makes it seem like two disgruntled parents talking to a principal. (laughs) And it made me laugh because they're like, they're holding hands and they're like, power couple activate. Mm. (laughs) And they're just like, I can't believe that you are treating Jaden, Caden, Aiden 
Like, he is a bully when he is just blah, 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 blah. You know, they... He is the nicest <laughs> child you've ever met. He would, does not have a bad bone in his body. Any problems you have is clearly the fault of your teachers. Exactly. And they just, I need to talk to your boss. Where's they, the superintendent? Send were, him in. They were very much sitting there like, we need to talk to the manager. And I was like, hmm, did Tahani give you tips? <laughs> so, yeah, that was pretty great. <laughs> I really like seeing evil Michael, too. Like, that was nice. Because we we don't get him. We miss him. I know. I miss him so much. I miss his, like, glee and anger. And snarkiness <laughs> and, and sassiness. And, oh, I love it so much. That whole sassiness of him sitting in the chair after the reveal of season one, knocking over the plant, just <laughs> with that look on his face. That's what I miss. Mm, that's big <laughs> energy. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that on our podcast. I'm going to have to make it explicit. Eleanor argues that she's incapable of love and she lacks free will. She believes that her relationship with Chidi was determined by Michael. He counters that free will exists because she did things he never predicted. Okay. Just because he didn't predict them doesn't mean he didn't set up the situation. So that's... I mean, Michael's not exactly the smartest demon on the block. No, I mean, his plans are only ever 50-50, right? <laughs> but... That's being a little <laughs> optimistic. Okay, yeah. But he does If it know... was 50-50, they would have only had, like, two reboots. Yeah, but he does know basically everything about Eleanor, right? Like, he says later he knows all of her desires and her shames and her fears and... He knows her genetic psychology, all of this stuff. Yes. So he should be able to predict what mm -hmm. she's going to do. Before we get too into the free will versus determination, I just want to point out that the philosophy book Eleanor pulls out is called A Complete Idiot's Guide to the Cliff Notes to Philosophy for Ding Dongs for Morons. And the tagline is, if this doesn't work, give up. It's also the abridged edition. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I like that. I thought that was quite funny. So earlier we were talking about um, how it's this really, I was saying, how it's this very romantic to think that no matter what, Eleanor and Chidi would find each other. Um, I don't know. Like, many of us on Earth now are thrown together because of choices other people made for us, but... That doesn't mean that I love the people in my life any less. It's such a weird thing because free will, you have this like feeling that you're free. You feel like these choices are made by you and only you, right? And sometimes, yeah, you feel kind of like, oh, well, I was stuck between a rock and a hard place and I couldn't really make that choice or someone made that choice for me. For me. But it's really, really hard to like reject and ignore that feeling of freedom like, of personal freedom. So I get why Michael is, like, not even having it with this argument. Mm -hmm. Because the show is showing us both things at the same time. We're getting free will and we're getting determinism. So I like that. I like that they're not taking one stance because people on Earth don't take one stance. Right? Like, we feel... I personally feel... Like, I make my own choices, mm -hmm. and I am free to make those choices, but I also feel like, well, some things are just predetermined about me, like, or this is how I feel because I grew up in this particular home, in this environment, and blah, 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 right? But those things can be changed. But that's what Eleanor is arguing, right? Yeah, She's like, Eleanor is... I had no choice because I'm just a product of my genetics and of my upbringing and my environment, and therefore I'm unable to make any choice. Right. Eleanor is an interesting case, though, because she's happy about that. She's... It seems to me like she's happy about it. She seems like, well, everything in my life has been determined. I'm not really... I'm everything that has happened to me is out of my control. I'm a jerk, but it's not my fault because of all the situations that are, you know, that made me this way. Mm -hmm. I'm just a, I'm just a pawn in life's game. Mm -hmm. I don't have any choice about who I am or what I do to people. That's one of the issues that people have with determinism is that it throws the concept of 
personal responsibility out the window. Mm. If everything is determined for you, if everything is destiny and fate and none of your choices are free, then you're not responsible for that, right? Like we wouldn't, in our current society now, we wouldn't place blame or praise on something that is 100% out of someone's control, right? In general, if you're a compassionate person, you don't um, hold a person responsible for uh, a mental illness. Right. For example, you wouldn't say that, well, they chose to be mentally ill. Mm -hmm. Well, you brought up fate, which is, I had a very difficult time discerning the difference between determinism and fate. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that fate is more about a deity being in control of our lives. Mm -hmm. whereas determinism would be the series of events giving us no choice in our actions. So, you know, God saying, you're going to go to work today and get a promotion and then you're going to win the lottery and you're going to be super happy for the rest of your life. Yeah. You're fated to do all this stuff. Yeah, like they'll say, God has a path for me or this is not my... This isn't God's will, Mm -hmm. I suppose, if something happens. um, It's predestination. That, how full of yourself do you have to think if you suddenly know what God's will is? Like, come on. This isn't God's will. Well, how do you know? Because (laughs) I'm pretty sure God would know. Well, I'll read the Bible, I guess. (laughs) So what struck me here, too, was... That hard determinism says, okay, there's no free will and everything in our lives is determined. Therefore, no one has more responsibility for their actions. How does that translate to the praise and punishment of the afterlife? The afterlife makes no sense then. So if the universe doesn't have some sort of element of free will, an afterlife would be completely illogical. Unless there has to be a balance. So it's predetermined that a lot of these people would have to get sent to the bad place because there needed to be a balance in, let's say, nature. Nature needs this balance of good and evil. Yeah, but that's what I'm like nature. What what do you mean by nature? Why would the universe needs needs balance? But (laughs) it just to me seems a little silly because determinism really is saying you're not morally responsible for your actions because guess what? You're not free to make any of those. Mm -hmm. They're already determined for you. Why would you judge people? I know. (laughs) Right? I don't know. It's such a bizarre concept. And that's why I think this show isn't taking either route. It's not saying that like everything is determined or we have a choice in everything that we do because it's reflective of the real world, right? Where most of us are pretty much compatibilists. Um, Compatibilism sometimes is referred to as soft determinism. And it basically says that that when an action of a person is self-determined or determined by causes internal to themselves, the action should be considered free. So something that is out of my control, like the fact that it's probably going to snow a whole bunch tonight, that's right. just completely outside of me. But myself personally deciding to go and walk in that snow outside, that's a choice that I made. I decided I need to go do that so I can get to work. Mm-hmm. So it's a combination of the two, which I like. And when I think about compatibilism in terms of Eleanor and Chidi's romance, Eleanor kissing Chidi should be considered a free act. Absolutely. Michael may have put them together and put them in these situations, but she's choosing to kiss him. Like, it's not Michael pushing their heads together. Yeah. It's basically putting the pieces on the board and seeing what they'll do. And that's that's free will, isn't it? Like It's almost the, like, je ne sais quoi of the universe. We can't exactly put our fingers on it. Like, we're not exactly sure when it's there, but we feel it. It's something you feel, like the X factor when people are talking about um, someone's talent. Like, you can't define it, but you know when it's there. It's like that quote about pornography, right? Where I'm not sure what pornography is, but I know it when I see it. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I just explained that like three times, but <laughs> <laughs> I just wasn't sure what was uh, what was going to hit best. But yeah, that's kind of how I see free will anyway. Like, 
it's hard to determine exactly what is free, but I know it when I feel it, I guess. So you can look back on decisions that you've made and kind of discern whether it was determined for you to make those decisions Mm -hmm. or whether it was just completely all you. Yeah, it was the choice that I made. And bringing it back to Eleanor and Chidi, like, yeah, Michael put all those pieces together on the chessboard, like you were saying, and seeing where exactly they're going to go. But we already know in so many different iterations that Chidi and Eleanor didn't kiss. They didn't fall in love. Mm -hmm. They were just friends. We already know that there's no predetermined one path. Right. So (laughs) it's very obvious that Eleanor is deflecting. And I get it. And it's interesting just to see her be like, no, 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 that's not what it is. Like, obviously, it's this logical thing of mine. It's very reminiscent of the whole idea behind the movie Inception. The whole point is for these people to get other people to make a certain decision. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, they have to influence certain aspects of their memories or their dreams or whatever. Mm -hmm. in order to make them feel like they came to this conclusion themselves, whereas it's all been manipulated. Mm. And that's also, you know, the best way to con somebody, right? Make you make them think it was their choice to begin with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He has to think it was his idea, so he'll do it. Yeah, exactly. Because he's not going to do it if he thinks that I'm telling him to. Mm -hmm. So to better understand free will and determinism without... Trying to parse through several um, articles on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is great, by the way, but, you know, wordy. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I watched uh, Hank Green's Crash Course episode on free will versus determinism, and he brought up Patricia Churchland, who is a contemporary Canadian-American philosopher. And she says that asking the question, am I free? is actually asking the wrong question. She thinks we should be asking how much control do I have? And the more control that you have, the more moral responsibility you also have. So this theory kind of allows us to keep what we know about the deterministic nature of the universe, what with climate change and tornadoes and all different kinds of things, things that are determined are going to happen, while also making sense of our subjective feeling of freedom. So if we think about... How much control do I have in a particular situation and deciding based on how much control you have, whether it is free will or determinism, how much control do you think Eleanor had over falling in love with Chidi? Love is such a hard thing to talk about, though, because I don't think people are in control of who they fall in love with. Yeah, it's and it's hard to define love, right? It's kind of like that. You know, the je ne sais quoi, the X factor, Mm -hmm. the stuff I was talking about before. Like, you could fall in love with someone you don't want to fall in love with. Like, you know the situation is wrong, or they're with somebody else, or you're with somebody else. Like, Mm -hmm. it can happen, and you don't want it to happen. Mm -hmm. You can't control your feelings exactly, right? But you can control your actions. You can control your actions. That's what I'm trying to say. Eleanor chose to kiss Chidi and then every day after that chose to be with him. So the last thing I want to say in this part is I looked up what exactly Eleanor's defense mechanism is and it's intellectualization. Um, Basically, she's removing herself emotionally from a stressful situation um, by focusing on facts and logic. Hmm. So the stressful situation would be that She's acknowledging she actually is capable of love. She experienced that love and then that love was taken away from her. Michael brings up the screen that shows a few of Eleanor's flaws. And I recommend looking at some of them because they are great. I just want to point out a couple of my favorites. And in the maternity ward, mother introduced her to nurse as my little sister. So her mom called Eleanor her little sister. (laughs) And then her Mr. Peanut tattoo. Oh, gosh. I'd like to know where that is. My favorite one was Eleanor's dad forgetting Eleanor's birthday and then deciding to change her birth certificate so that he wasn't wrong. (laughs) It's like, no, 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 no. That's way more Your birthday was definitely last week. Check 
like the birth certificate. Way more work. And I just want to say that I'm guessing he had it corrected by like mm, whiting it out and writing it in pencil. Okay. Because I really don't have a lot of faith in his abilities. <laughs> that board is great. And that's also one of the things I miss about being in the good place is just having stuff randomly pop up here and there. You don't really have the opportunity to do that on Earth. Yeah, Michael's got his powers back in the good place. And it's nice to see. Janet's got her powers and all they have to rely on Janet's technology now. Yeah. Which is really convenient. Mm-hmm. Eleanor continues to argue that free will doesn't exist, and she posits that Michael's behavior is determined by unknown forces. He points out that she's lashing out because she feels vulnerable. He pours iced tea on her head and counters that if everything is determined, then all their efforts are pointless, and he needs to believe otherwise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We get two different reactions, which I guess are pretty common to free will and determinism. Um, defeatism and aspiration. So we get to see Eleanor kind of feeling a little bit defeated, like, oh, should I even bother ordering a drink? Because it doesn't really matter because it's all outside of my control anyway. And how that kind of attitude can be really bad. Well, yeah, she wouldn't even get a drink. Yeah, she would just sit there like, well, I guess whatever is going to happen. I guess I was determined not to have a drink then. Yeah. And we get to see that Michael aspires to move forward and save souls. And at the end of the episode, talking about like a blueprint for all of humanity, like the perfect that can person. be just as detrimental as defeatism. Because if you have this idea that like, ah, oh, I am fully control of everything when something inevitably fails because you're not in control of everything. And then you have a breakdown like Chidi. Yeah, exactly. You're going to make a bunch of chili with peeps. Is that how you want to end up, Michael? I'm just saying. That stuff looks gross. He already had his crisis. Yeah, he can't have another one. You only get one. <laughs> yeah, because on Earth, you can't just conjure up a Corvette and a, you know, a hot babe to go by your side. I mean, Eleanor's like right there, so That's rude. <laughs> uh, I love the moment where Michael pours iced tea on her head. And I really want to make a meme out of that moment. You know, like the internet's doing a whole bunch of memes now. I know, it's <laughs> shocking, right? Like, it's brand new news. <laughs> Shush. Where anyway. are you reading about this? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so that image, I've already screenshotted it. I'm going to put it out into the world. And I want like people being like, oh, Michael is my exams, pouring it onto me, Eleanor, or something silly. I want it to happen. It's going to be memed. Um, you heard it here first. Yeah, you heard it here. It's going to go on that Twitter account of mine that has over 100,000 followers now. What? It's pretty cool. It's a lot of pressure. I definitely like Eleanor's rebuttal of, what if this is this mega demon is torturing Michael <laughs> and their bosses, the super mega demons, are fulfilling their destiny laid out by super intelligent tarantula squids. It's like she brought back tarantula squid. Yeah, and it's also a little more fan theories squashed. Mm. Like, what if Michael's being tortured this entire time? That's been a theory for the past three seasons. Mm -hmm. Is that it's Michael's bad test? Place. Yeah, yeah, Michael's bad place. Ooh. Sometimes a cup of iced tea is just a cup of iced tea, and sometimes it's a weapon, like it was tonight. Tonight. Yeah. All right, you want to get to the end? Michael and Eleanor pick up the rest of the group at the airport. Eleanor apologizes for her defensiveness and decides that since they're the only truly free beings on Earth, they need to do more. Michael suggests that they go to Canada to find a blueprint for humanity. And meanwhile, Sean creates an illegal portal and travels to Earth with Vicky and a couple other demons. So obviously the best person would be in Canada because we're so nice. Yeah, totally. They're going to go see Doug Forsett, right? They have to be, but it he's from make... what Calgary? Sure, but it doesn't. That's not even rural. But Canada. didn't he die in the seventies? I think maybe he was born in the seventies, or he had that theory in the seventies, like he had the moment where he got high in okay. the seventies. Okay, and then since time came up is with about Jeremy Barramy, he okay. Yeah. Hmm. I'm hoping that they're suggesting they're going to go see Doug Forsett and not that. 
Canada is some perfect place where they're going to find a blueprint for humanity because they're going to be disappointed. I mean, we're cool in certain ways, but we're not perfect. Not even close. I'm excited to see some really fun Canadian jokes. We've been seeing a lot of jokes towards Floridians and Arizonians and Nevadians. I don't know. And Australians. Yes, and Australians. And now, potentially, we're going to get razzed a little. And I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. It's going to be great. <laughs> I'm definitely expecting some horrible accents, uh, a couple of Mounties, probably a beaver and a moose uh, somewhere. An igloo? Putsin is going to be in there, <laughs> an igloo. Uh, yeah, it's going to be... I hope a... they're all in one place. Yeah. All those things. Yes. Oh, I'm going to hear a lot of a boots. That is not how we say about. That is not how we say about. No. There's a U in there. I can feel it. Yeah. About. That U is the X factor. I can feel it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm really, really happy to see Bad Place Demons again. It's nice to see Sean and Vicky. Of course, Vicky, who's like right in the middle of her sentence. And when I went back to watch the last episode she was in, it was like perfect. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Tia Sirkar did a fantastic job of just, like, being in that headspace. And she says, how long was I out? It was about 13 episodes, Vicky. It was about 13 <laughs> episodes. You've missed a lot. Yes. <laughs> Here, Here's season two, okay? And Catch here's up. most of season three. Yeah, binge it. It'll be great. So, overall, what did you think of this episode? It was good. I liked being back in the good place. Mm -hmm. I think that's mainly why I liked it. And it talked a lot about Eleanor and who she is as a person and what she's scared of and her vulnerabilities. Yeah. So it's nice to see that kind of bring it down a little bit from the, the last few episodes that were kind of out there with their sets and, well, not necessarily their sets, but where they went and mm. the people that they were interacting with, like seeing Donkey Doug and how dumb everybody was there in Jacksonville and dealing with Eleanor's mom and like it's nice to bring it down a little bit mm -hmm. reel it back in yeah for sure and the good place is our home as viewers we're so used to that world that yeah. that a lot of people have been having kind of a hard time being on earth this season um it's been kind of a bummer well yeah, I mean, I don't think that Earth makes it a bummer, but I think it's just very unfamiliar. I think being on Earth is a bummer. Okay. The show has been fantastical. It's okay. been, there's been powers and fantasy elements of sci, like there's been a lot of sci-fi as well with Janet being able to do what Janet does best and mm -hmm. creating people and seeing demons and then suddenly they're back on earth and all of that is gone yeah the magic of mm -hmm. the show which is where we started like you said like we yeah. started in the good place we started with all these elements mm -hmm. that are just ripped away yeah i enjoyed this episode too of course i just enjoy eleanor and chidi everybody knows that by now um but more than that i enjoyed the philosophy of this episode. Yep. I'm really excited now that we're turning things uh, around a little bit with Sean coming onto Earth. Well, that should be interesting. So, Yeah, hopefully it goes somewhere. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just fizzle out. Like, we're introducing a, you know, a conflict, and then we're going to get rid of it in one episode like they have been doing constantly. I'm I'm thinking that this is this is where they're going now. Okay. Judging on our past actions, our environment, and uh, the upbringing of this podcast, I think it's pretty much determined that we're going to have a mailbag section. Our first piece of mail comes from Sierra at callous underscore strange on Twitter. Sierra wrote, What you were saying about someone with a hundred sandwiches versus one reminds me of something I think was said about effective altruism. Which is, if Mark Zuckerberg gives away $1 billion, he still has $30 billion. So we should view him as someone with $30 billion who gave away nothing. Obviously, if you take that attitude to the extreme, you could say that any purchase above the bare necessities is you actively choosing not to feed someone or house someone. 
I don't know if I agree with that, but I think our Western capitalist world could use a lot more of the effective altruistic attitude, especially in our taxation policies. Do you think that the good place has an effective altruism mindset? Oof. Ooh, okay. Um, maybe a little. Keep in mind, we don't actually know who is in the good place. We have kind of a general idea, and we are assuming that genuinely good human beings are there, uh, based on what we've heard from Michael. We know that Tahani had a lot of money. She also gave a lot of money away, or raised a lot of money, um, but the reason she wasn't there was because of her motivation. So if effective altruism is simply giving most of what you have of yourself, of your wealth, of possessions, if that's the good place's criteria, I suppose. Um, it's going to be fairly empty. Yeah. You're going to have to really to the population of the world. Yeah, you're really going to have to have people that gave everything of themselves mm-hmm. for other people. And it's possible, right? We have this idea that the good place is not very um heavily populated <laughs> with the bad place getting the majority of human beings. So it's very possible. I don't know. Mm-hmm. That's a very interesting question. Um what do you think? Do you think that the good place has an effective altruism mindset, let us know. Our next message comes from JP Edmonds at JP underscore Edmonds. I feel like Eleanor wins the predestination versus free will debate. Michael oversimplifies the issue when he claims that just one unforeseen act discredits her. He only gains the upper hand when he calls out Eleanor on her emotional insecurity, not her logic. Mm -hmm. I kind of disagree with you here because simply proving that one of her actions was free will kind of means that many of her other actions could also have been free will yeah you only really need one example uh to show that it exists Mm -hmm. not that it is i don't think he's arguing that everything is free will but just proving that there's one instance of it means it's there yeah eleanor seems very stonewally like she's saying just everything is predetermined i had no choice in anything but as soon Mm -hmm. as michael gives her just one example i think that's enough for her to see that it's possible that there are other examples as well if she looks for them yeah and that's the moment where you can see eleanor is kind of trying to work it out in her head how she's going to argue against this and that's when she brings up, well, what if your actions are determined by somebody? So it's like she's just trying to go even over Michael's head at this mm. point. I agree with you, though. Like, he only does gain the upper hand when he calls her out on it and says, no, you're just afraid of vulnerability. He does get the upper hand at that moment because Eleanor just wasn't going to believe him. She was so entrenched in her viewpoint because that kept her emotionally safe. Our next piece of mail comes from Daryl at Kali97 on Twitter. Daryl said, Number one, I didn't realize how much I missed seeing the gang in the fake good place. We agree with you there, Mm Daryl. Two, I wonder what they'll do with cheating Eleanor now. I don't think they'll immediately be together again. I think that now, since Eleanor knows she's capable of love, she'll be more open to real relationships and actually being close to someone. I really like that idea. I think it would be a terrible move to get them together immediately because that's just not cheating Eleanor. We've already seen that that doesn't happen with them. Mm -hmm. Once Chidi saw the videotape of them saying they love each other, he didn't immediately fall in love with Eleanor. Yeah. It wasn't like, oh, at that moment, I'm going to kiss you. It took a few episodes. And I like the idea that she's now acknowledging that she's capable of love and she's going to be able to grow closer to everybody in soul squad daryl goes on to say number three this episode reminded me of debate that has been going on for very many years in the christian community free will versus predestination do we do things because we ourselves want to do them or has every decision and choice we made uh already been decided for us Mm -hmm. yeah 100 percent uh it's (laughs) it's still being debated Every single day, and I don't really think we're ever going to get to a point where it's not debated. The day that religion dies 
is the day that that stops being debated. <laughs> will religion ever die? I don't know exactly. if it will. I don't think um, so. Yeah. I, I really like that it took this on, but without making it about a deity. Mm-hmm. So that was nice. And lastly, Daryl says, I love Michael's speech at the end. Even if we didn't really have our own free will, that doesn't make our choices and our feelings meaningless. Even if we don't really have our free will and everything is determined, our choices and our feelings about those choices and our feelings every day about other people's choices aren't meaningless just because maybe everything is determined, right? It's like, I still feel a certain way. For example, I still feel love for you. If everything was predetermined, should I not feel love for you? Those feelings are still meaningful because meaning is interpreted by the person. What if we had the knowledge that Eleanor and, you know, Michael have? What if what if we knew that everything was predetermined? What if we knew without a doubt that there was no no choice? We had no, you know, we had no choice in our actions. Right. Okay. so, for example... I don't know if uh, that the, would be the same. And this is, okay, my example is uh, it related to romance. So in the movie Timer, in that universe, um, by the way, great movie. You should definitely check it out. Emma Caulfield is the main character. She was Anya and Buffy. She's fabulous. In that movie, that universe, everyone has a soulmate and they know when they're going to meet that soulmate. So they get this little timer on their wrist that counts down to the moment that they meet their soulmate. That's huge, Mm -hmm. right? You know, what if I don't meet my soulmate until I'm 50 years old? Am I just supposed to not enjoy myself now because I'm fated to be with someone else? Like all of those feelings are still valid, right? Like the feelings and the choices that you end up making. Maybe they just feel less. Like, they feel like you're more numb to them because you know they don't matter. Because if you're so certain that you're not making that choice, then, yeah, do you really fall in love in the same way? It's something that you can debate for hours and years, but nobody will ever really know because we don't have that knowledge. We can postulate and hypothesize and other fancy words. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, we just don't know. Maybe the closest you could get is being put into an arranged marriage, getting divorced, and then falling in love with someone you didn't expect to fall in love with. Oof. Yeah. Wow. It's tough. <laughs> Go check out that movie, though. Yeah, it's a really good movie. It's a really it's good movie. Hardly anybody I know has ever heard about it. It's so good. Okay. It's fun. Um. Thank you, Daryl and JP and Sierra for your messages. Um, Daryl, your message made me think of the statement, um, everything happens for a reason and how that's supposed to be comforting. But in the context of this episode, it's kind of not. (laughs) Well, like, oh my goodness, you just lost your child. I'm so sorry for you. But everything happens for a reason. Yeah. But people are supposed to, like, people say that all the time. If someone gets divorced, it's like, well, you know, everything happens for a reason. Don't worry. You're going to be fine. It's supposed to be comforting. But sometimes it's just like, I don't want to hear that, Susan. Okay? Yeah, so just be quiet. Just back <laughs> off. Susan. Take your tray of homemade cookies and leave. Yeah. Actually, Arch- leave the tray. Actually, I will eat those cookies. <laughs> okay. So that brings us to the end of Forking Bullshirt, a multiverse radio production. If you like the show, please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. This is the best way for others to find the show. And if you want to get in touch with us, we're on Twitter at Multiverse Radio. You can tag your thoughts with hashtag FBullshirt. And we're also on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast. And you can email us from our website, www.multiverseradio.ca. We also run the No Context Good Place account on Twitter. So you should definitely go check that one out. Uh, We also have a Tumblr of the exact same account. Uh, because I'm extra, so. <laughs> you know, just just crossed, go enjoy all that. Just stuff. crossed my mind. Like we don't copy and paste this section of the podcast. Like we just repeat it every single time. What do you mean? Yeah, we repeat it every single time because I say it differently every single time. But we could just copy and paste it. Lame. I'm not doing that. I want to live in the moment, Jason. I'm making free choices. <laughs>
It will not be determined for me. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Wait, can we just have like big beep energy? Can we do that? Okay, we do we're that. gonna do that.